Hi! Welcome to the second part of this episode about categories in music. In the first part, I talked a little bit about where folk and classical music come from and what differentiates them. In this episode, I'll talk more about where the ideas we have about these categories come from. And then I'll talk a little bit about the sort of strange in-between place that popular music tends to occupy in all this. Once again, I did this a couple of months ago, so you might notice that my hair was quite a bit shorter at the time. We have a lot to talk about, so let's not dilly-dally. I'm Peter, and this is We Need to Talk About Music. amount of the ideas and images that we connect with both classical and folk music today are traceable to a philosophical movement called Romanticism that started in what would later become Germany in the late 18th century and has since made its influence felt all over the world. Actually, almost all of this influence is traceable to the ideas of just one guy, and he's not even that famous. Johann Gottfried Herder, who lived from 1744 to 1803, was first introduced to me, either in college or maybe my first year of graduate school, as a founding figure of nationalism. He was that, but it's kind of a shame that that's the main way he gets remembered today, because for us, nationalism is bagged up with a whole bunch of cultural chauvinism and violence, which he actually explicitly condemned in his work. Also, he did a bunch more, so let's talk about him a little bit. Herder was a theologian, philosopher, and literary critic who came from humble origins, but managed to go to a university and even become a student of Immanuel Kant. After his studies, he ended up in the German city of Weimar, where he had a major influence on and on-again, off-again friendships with some big-time German literary figures like Johann Wolfgang von Goethe and Friedrich Schiller. Herder's big idea was that people were tied together by the language and culture of the place where they lived, and not just by their place in the social hierarchy. This might not sound all that revolutionary, but that's just a testament to how influential his ideas have been. Before this time, at least in Europe, the conventional wisdom was quite the opposite. Social and intellectual elites, two groups that obviously overlapped a lot, saw themselves as belonging to a unified high culture, totally distinct from the rabble who labored to support them. When they wrote, they did so in Latin or another international aristocratic language, or lingua franca. In some cases, leaders never even bothered to learn the languages of the people they ruled over. This way of thinking had its own historical context, but Herder saw it as out of date and morally suspect he began to promote a rather mystical and platonic idea that the language of a place and the culture associated with that language contains some fundamental truth about the people of that place, which he called the folk. He encouraged writers, starting with those in his own circle, to embrace their local language, in this case German, and to write stories that engaged with specific local culture. This was revolutionary in at least two ways, both of which are important for us. First, Herder shifted ordinary people, who were necessarily more in touch with local languages and local culture, to the center of the story. Before this point, when elites talked about culture, they were almost exclusively talking about elite culture. The lives of everyone who fell outside of that network were regarded as an embarrassing necessity, or at best, a pastoral fantasy. But Herder, who had come to the elite from outside, repositioned ordinary people as purveyors of truth from whom elites would have to learn if they wanted to truly know themselves. In this context, the stories and songs of ordinary people took on great significance. Collecting and publishing folk songs a term he actually coined, became a major focus in Herder's career, and gradually an obsession that spread through what would later become Germany and on out into the rest of the world. The idea of folk music as a key to revealing the secret truth of a culture 
has been very influential since. It's been the driver of several major folk revival movements, and it's still a major influence today, as anyone who's been through elementary school in the United States can tell you. Herder's ideas also granted a status to the writers of stories that had previously been reserved for philosophers and theologians. Culture, as Herder saw it, was full of emotion and frustration and other messy human stuff. And the abstract thought that was promoted by rationalism tended to sweep a lot of that stuff under the rug. Stories were better at getting at the irrationality that Herder believed lay at the heart of humanity. It didn't take so long for this idea to be extended to the other arts, especially music, and the implications of this shift can hardly be overstated. Before this point, a piece of music, however skillfully crafted, was fundamentally seen as a functional object, and the person who created it, however skilled, was seen as a functionary. This isn't to say that people didn't appreciate good art, but their appreciation was rooted in its ability to serve a purpose. By reframing art as a new kind of philosophy, Herder's Romanticism provided a whole new way for people to appreciate art objects, completely divorced from their original purpose. The idea of the great work, or classic, was born. Meanwhile, the craftsperson who had the ability to create these great works was also reframed as a genius, a word that had not often been applied to such lowly creative professionals before. This was the beginning of the classical music concept we live with today. Once this idea caught steam, it was unstoppable. Musicians strove to have their genius recognized so that their works might be added to the newly developing canon to be heard by countless generations into the future. Meanwhile, the new field of musicology was developed to hunt down the unrecognized geniuses and classics of the past so that their greatness might be retrospectively celebrated. Some of these ideas have recently come to be somewhat tempered and questioned, but there's no doubt that they're still very much with us today. And then there's popular music, that awkward sibling that always seems to be stepping on the other's toes. The introduction of popular music, the last of our three poles, is where things start to get really slippery, because it has so much in common with the other two that it's very hard to say where one ends and the others begin. In our era, popular music has come to dominate. I don't think it would be out of line to say that popular music is now the most important of the three poles. It's certainly the one that surrounds most of us as we go through our lives. But this dominance is really the result of historical circumstances. So what exactly is popular music? You might already have noticed that the terms popular music and folk music are essentially the same. They both mean music of the people just one using a word that comes from the Latin populus, and the other using a word that comes from the German folk. They might even have the same Indo-European root, although this isn't quite clear. This is because both popular music and folk music have traditionally been associated with ordinary people, as opposed to elites. But while folk music is music made by ordinary people for each other, Popular music could be understood as music that's made for ordinary people through, you guessed it, some kind of mediating infrastructure. Like a song publisher or a record company. It's this mediation that has often given popular music a questionable reputation, which is just a bit odd considering that classical music is also heavily mediated and doesn't usually inspire this kind of hand-wringing, but what are you going to do? There's been a tendency to understand the mediation of popular music as an all-dominating force that completely eliminates the possibility for creative expression and exposes listeners to dangerous influences and mind-numbing manipulations. This point of view has been associated with old-school Marxist music critics, but they didn't invent it. You could find the same basic attitude in Plato's writings on music, or St. Augustine's, and even today, among popular music fans, it's not uncommon to hear the words pop or poppy used to derisively refer to music someone doesn't like. Half-truths can be even more dangerous than full-on lies. The mediation of popular music can absolutely be a negative force. 
It has absolutely been wielded to manipulate people and limit their creative expression. The history of popular music is, to a certain extent, a history of abusive power dynamics, unchecked selfishness, and snuffed potential. But anyone who's spent any time with popular music over the past hundred years or so knows that that's not the whole story. What's so fascinating about the history of popular music, to me anyway, is that it's a constant tug of war between those who seem to be indifferent to anything but their own greed and those who actually want to express themselves musically, or help others to do so, while also making some money for themselves and their families. What's so incredible about this fight is how often the latter group has managed to beat the odds and win. There have probably been many popular music traditions through history, but it's not that well documented. Often, the only way we can know it existed at all is when someone got nervous about it and tried to shut it down. The popular music tradition that we live with was born in the folk music of people who had been brutally kidnapped from their homes. They were forced to cobble together what they could retain from their own tradition with bits and pieces that they found on the site of their horrific imprisonment. These terrible circumstances led to the creation of something completely new which is not something that happens all that often. The excitement of this newness can already be seen in the first accounts of the music of enslaved African Americans, often from the pens of the very people who enslaved them. Professional musicians and sheet music publishers also took notice, first in the grotesque parody of minstrelsy, and later in the crazes for ragtime and blues that came at the beginning of the 20th century. The century since then has seen an explosion of creativity and diversity in popular music unlike anything else in history. Exploring the story of this explosion to contextualize bits of it that I find meaningful is one of the main things I want to do with this show going forward. So for now, I'll just say a few words about why I think this might have happened. In part, I think it's the result of technological developments, beginning with audio recording, which have gradually removed or replaced layers of mediation to the point where now it's possible for someone to record and release music with a telephone, and more importantly, without anyone's permission. This has allowed popular musicians to attain a directness of communication approaching that of folk music, and a cultivation of style more akin to the classical tradition, thus further blurring the lines between the three streams. Another key factor, I would argue, is rooted in popular musicians' knack for repurposing. Think, for example, of intentionally overdriven guitars in rock and roll, alternative trumpet fingerings in jazz, turntable techniques in hip-hop, or the use of drum machines to create unplayable rhythms in electronic dance music. All of these uses are subversions of the original purpose for which these technologies were designed and all of them are shining examples of what's made this era of popular music so exciting. Really, the idea of expressing oneself musically within a system that's primarily motivated by profit is not so dissimilar. This fundamental characteristic of modern popular music may be rooted more than anything else in the experiences of the African-American artists who've been its prime innovators. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that non-African Americans haven't also made valuable contributions to popular music, just that those contributions have inevitably been indebted to previous contributions by African Americans. Life under systemic racism is not something that I will ever be able to come close to truly understanding. I do know, though, that for more than 400 years, black people in America have been struggling to make meaningful lives for themselves and their families against a system that has been, at best, indifferent to their right even to exist. Just living under those circumstances requires that someone develop skills in subverting intended purposes. Problematically, it's exactly those skills that have made popular music so exciting. I recently heard someone say that it's not really possible to simply embrace all the good things about the South, the region that I come from, and reject the bad stuff, because without the bad stuff, the good stuff wouldn't really exist. As much as it may complicate our enjoyment of things, the same is true of popular music. 
Okay, that's my show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, tune in next week when I'll be leaving these generalizations behind and getting into something more specific. For the meantime, try to stay healthy and happy, and don't forget to listen to some music now and then.